this week on the climate show what sounds like a heresy. We don't need to save honeybees. In fact, there may be too many of them. Hello and welcome to The Climate Show. Now, it's World Bee Day this weekend, but I'll be finding out why beehives like these could actually be harming nature. Also on the programme, the public transport subscription that Germany hopes will help kick the country's car addiction. As wildfires rage, an election is being held in Canada's oil-rich patch that could influence national climate policy. And we show you the science behind the search for more climate-friendly sheep. Save the bees has become a clarion call in recent years, leading to many people getting colonies themselves. But now scientists are saying all those hives may be doing more harm than good. Flourishing nature needs abundant bees. They are essential for the reproduction of wildflowers and the production of many crops so news that they might be in peril triggered a 21st century boom in beekeepers. What is there not to like about bees? Bees are really, really fascinating insects. Um, they communicate in a very complicated way. Their societies are really structured. I started beekeeping because I had a mild itch. Uh, the more I learned about bees, the more I wanted to learn about bees. They're fantastic. My queens, uh, the one on the left hand side is called Little Liz, and the one on the right hand side is called Megan and they both get on very well. But be careful what you wish for. Recent studies suggest our taste for the honeybee has gone too far. In urban areas where it's very built up and there's not a lot of forage for bees, there just simply isn't enough food out there for them. Um, and keeping one species a pollinator does not necessarily mean you're going to help the rest of them. Here at Kew Gardens, they have a greater variety of wild bees than almost any other garden in Britain. I'll take you around here and we'll have a look at this uh, comfrey or symphytum, which is uh, usually buzzing with wild bees at this time of day. Beautiful colour. I always gather that bees like blue. Is that just simplistic no, there or is, is it true? No, absolutely. <laughs> there, is, there is scientific evidence. In fact, you can see a Bombus terrestris uh, right here. Bumblebee, seen, I believe. I've, sorry, a bumblebee, <laughs> that's right. And then I've seen some hairy-footed flower bees. And their studies, looking across London, have seen those wild populations wilt as honeybee colonies blossomed. A similar trend has been seen nationwide. It's all about the density of hives. So our work suggested that about seven hives per square kilometre was about as much as London could tolerate, considering okay. the green space that we've got available. We've got quite a lot of green space yeah. in London. Uh, in some locations in London, there are more than 50 hives per square kilometre. And in one particular location, there are 400 hives in a square kilometre and they all need feeding. So that is thousands of mouths in an empty supermarket. Absolutely, in fact, each hive is between 20 and 50,000 hungry mouths. Pollination is the act of taking the pollen between the male and female parts of different flowers, allowing seeds to form. Vital for crops like rapeseed or soy and fruits like strawberries or apples. Hundreds of different bee species do the job. We've got over 100 species that we've recognised uh, or described here in Kew Gardens wow. to give you an idea of the kind of bee diversity that you get. Have you got a favourite? Uh, I probably do, actually. I think it's the hairy-footed flower bee. We actually saw one of these flying about in the symphytum. So hairy-footed flower bees come in two forms. So that's the female with black uh, body and yellow hairy legs or hairy feet, and that's the male there. And they're often some of the earliest bees you get in the garden. Other pollinating insects beside wild bees can suffer from competition with honeybees. Beetles, wasps, moths, butterflies and flies, like this aptly named bee fly. I think I want to see one of these wild bees for real. So the only way to do it is to catch one. And my hunting trainer is Ellen Baker, who's a PhD student here. Ellen, how am I going to do this? So we've come to one of the flowers that we've got a lot of the bumblebees on. We've got one of our native bee species, Bombus pascorum, and we're going to go for a nice downward swipe and then put the net on the floor and we're going to put her in a little pot so we can have a closer okay. look. They are kind of like a ginger, ginger colour. Did we get it? We got it. We got it. We got it. And are these the kind of wild pollinators that we need to encourage? 
Exactly. So wild bees like this can really do with our support in our gardens at home, but also in terms of like bigger national decisions that we make. And how do we encourage them? It's all about basically giving them space to live and stuff to eat. So by and large, that means conserving areas that we have and planting more flowers in places where there's not enough. Simple as that, habitat, habitat, habitat. It really, really is, to be honest. I mean, bees have been doing like really well for a long time without our help. And now as the landscape's changing, they need our help more and more. Don't want to create an even more angry bee. We probably ought to let her go. Yeah. So have beekeepers got the message? Gently pulling this out so that we don't disturb them. It always amazes me how tolerant they are to this kind of disturbance. This honey hub is just beside the city of London, but all bar one of these hives are now being moved out of town to make room for more wild pollinators. In essence, why are you deciding to scale back the amount of hives here? Well, we can actually see that there are sufficient honeybees here. Some would say that the concentration that we see, London is the Europe's most densely populated city for honeybees, possibly the world. We've been hijacked by the Save the Bees motto, which has been interpreted as meaning honeybees. Well, guess what? The honeybee is in great fettle. The UN hive data for honeybees globally shows you that they're at an all-time high. So what we need to do is impact, see the impact that these honeybees, with their proliferation, especially in places like London, is having on other pollinators and in particular other wild bees. So save the plants that pollinators need. Less catchy as a slogan, more true to the science. Now as many workers here grapple with the cost of living crisis, including steep rises in the cost of commuting, one scheme in Germany is attracting some envious glances as our Europe correspondent Siobhan Robbins reports. Is a green transport revolution coming down the tracks in Germany? As season ticket costs for British commuters soar, Germans can now travel the whole country for just over £40 a month. We had a real complicated uh, tariff and ticket system in Germany and now we uh, have introduced just one ticket valid for the whole month for only 49 euros and there is no risk you can uh, get away, get rid of it uh, after a month if you, if you would like to. It's very simple and that's like a ticket revolution in Germany. Friedrichstraße, Ostkreuz. It's valid for unlimited journeys on the country's trains, trams, buses, subways and even some ferries. Only high-speed services are excluded, and it's popular. To date, seven million have been sold. The advantages are that I can use it all in Germany, and I don't have the different constructions. If I go to Hamburg, for example, I, have, I don't have to look if uh, I need a ticket or not, and which are the conditions of this ticket in Hamburg, for example. So I have one ticket for Germany, and everywhere it's okay. Wichtig finde ich es schon, weil man natürlich mit den eigenen PKW nicht fahren muss, weil man mit den öffentlichen fahren kann, wo man auch, denke ich, einen Beitrag für die Umwelt leistet. The new ticket is based on a nine euro pilot pass last summer, designed to help Germans with the cost of living crisis. That cut car journeys by 10%, preventing 1.8 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions. The ticket is cheaper than, um, than going to the gas station, um, going for a ride. And uh, that's why we, we think it will it will be a measure, a successful um, measure for fighting the climate change. But campaigners say more needs to be done to curb the country's car culture. While it is offering this uh, 49 euro ticket, on the other hand, it's still building more highways. Actually, in transport policy, Germany is far, far, far away from being green. We're a car dependent society and this needs to change. Critics also point to the three billion euro cost and say it does nothing to improve public transport 
in rural areas. But the price might just be justified if it breaks Germany's autobahn addiction. Siobhan Robbins, Sky News, Berlin. Now, across the Atlantic, a Canadian provincial election isn't normally something that would gather much international attention. But as voters go to the polls in Alberta at the end of this month, plenty of eyes are trained there. It's the western province that hosts Canada's enormous oil sands industry, one of the most carbon-intensive ways to produce the fuel. Despite its squeaky clean global image, Canada actually has a poor track record on climate action, with its average emissions per person sitting much higher than most of its western peers and nearly three times that of the average British person. That's why Justin Trudeau has been announcing a tranche of new plans to bring down the country's emissions, including targeting the oil sector. But to do much of what he wants, he needs a friendly government on side in Alberta, a place where he's enormously unpopular. And where the current Conservative Premier, Danielle Smith, has threatened to block anything that damages the oil and gas industry. That's despite the province being increasingly exposed to the dangers of climate change, with a May heatwave smashing records in the last few weeks and starting intense wildfires that, ironically, have halted oil production in many areas and have forced tens of thousands from their homes. Well, to talk us through this, I'm joined by Calgary-based environment journalist Drew Anderson. Drew, thanks for joining us. You know, as you get closer to this election, what's actually happening on the ground in Alberta? Well, it's an interesting time to have an election, that's for sure. Um, the province, especially in the north, has been hit with massive wildfires. Um, so that's sort of this, you know, almost apocalyptic background to, to this election that's happening right now. There's not actually a lot of talk about climate change in the province right now, certainly from the politicians. Um, but scientists have directly linked these sort of increased incidences to climate change. <laughs> Perhaps wind me back a bit. I mean... It's an interesting place. You've got these wildfires, possibly linked to climate change. You've got a massively carbon intensive uh, oil resource there. You've got an election going on. And yet, as you say, climate change is not a, a, a big part in this. I mean, how come? Explain a bit about the politics and the society there. Alberta's a unique place. I mean, this is a place where people care about the environment, but it is also a place where, you know, 100,000 people work in the oil patch. Um, the economy is directly linked to it. The provincial, you know, fortunes, the budget sinks and swims on the price of a barrel of oil. Um, it is enmeshed in this society. So it's a really complicated conversation. You can't really win an election in this place while demonizing the oil and gas industry. It's, it's, it's a losing proposition. But there is also this big conversation that we need to have about climate change and its impacts like these fires that are burning. Give me the potted profile of the two main candidates in this election and, and how they relate to this issue. We've got, um, you know, the UCP government, the United Conservative Party. Um, they were in power before the election was called. Um, they are to the right um, and led by a fairly new arrival in terms of the premiership in Daniel Smith, who has been buffeted by um, controversy um, since she assumed the helm of the party about seven months ago. Is she a bit Trumpian or is that a sort of lazy stereotype? Um, it might be a lazy stereotype, but it's not necessarily inaccurate. Um, that is certainly an accusation that's been leveled. I'm guessing pretty pro, un unashamedly pro the oil industry. Would that be right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and is setting herself up for fights with the federal government over environmental policies. Talk me through that, because, you know, there is a lot of power in the provinces in Canada. So what, what is it she might wish to block? Just in the very near future, we've got a government that's pushing aggressively towards its net zero by 2050 targets. A, a, a nationalist, a, you know, a national government, you mean, yeah. Nationally, yep. Yeah. Um, you know, they want a net, net zero electricity grid by 2035. A lot not to like if you are, in effect, a, a petro province. Um, tell me about the, uh, the more left wing uh, uh, opponent. Yeah, so it's interesting. We've got a social democratic party sort of on the left, um, the new democratic party led by Rachel Notley, but they've actually positioned themselves pretty squarely in the center of the spectrum. And again, you can't win an election while demonizing oil and gas here. So they are pro-industry, but they take a more temperate approach. Uh, when they were in power between 2015 and 2019, 
They brought in a fairly ambitious climate plan to tackle emissions in this province while working with industry. And they've been sort of cautious in this election not to talk about it. Um, so we do have the UCP on the right, who is, you know, trumpeting, uh, fighting with the federal government, protecting oil and gas jobs. And then we've got the NDP sort of in the center, hoping not to really talk about it, but certainly supportive broadly of these policies from the the federal government if the united conservative party the more right-wing candidate is uh elected re-elected what impact could that have on on national policy does it destabilize things nationally for canada just briefly absolutely um if you've got a premier that is you know determined to fight uh and to fight hard on all of those policies that are coming down that's going to destabilize and delay these conversations and this process. Um, and they have proven themselves willing to go as far as the Supreme Court of Canada to try and block these sorts of things. A really interesting microcosm of the pain of transitioning away from a world economy based on oil and gas. Uh, Drew, thank you very much indeed for your time. It is interesting. What's happening there is a little bit like the pain that's being felt in parts of our economy that are dependent on North Sea oil and gas as that winds down. Well, after the break, we'll be looking at how sheep could be bred to become more climate friendly. And also we'll be catching up with Sasha Dench as she looks at how a big renewable energy project in Morocco could affect migratory birds. Welcome back to The Climate Show. Now, one of the toughest nuts to crack when it comes to global warming is the methane, a really powerful greenhouse gas that comes out of cows and sheep, both ends, as a matter of fact. So finding a breed that emitted less of that would be a prize really to be wished for. And our science and technology editor, Tom Clark, has been looking at some promising developments. For Rob Hodgkin's flock, it must feel a bit like being abducted by aliens. Arriving in their Hertfordshire barn to find it home to a space-age trailer containing sheep-shaped chambers into which each is sealed in the name of planetary science. 821, 20.9% oxygen. In fact, this is an experiment to study how much methane each sheep produces. Because when it comes to global climate, ruminants, cud-chewing animals, are a major source of this greenhouse gas. There are 3.6 billion domesticated cows, sheep and goats on the planet. Their digestive systems create nearly a third of human-linked methane emissions. And while short-lived, methane has about 28 times more global warming potential than carbon dioxide. A government grant has helped bring this equipment from New Zealand, where the methane emissions from this breed of sheep has been extensively studied. This is the first time it's been used in the UK. Each year, British sheep belch out methane equivalent to about 5 million tonnes of planet-warming carbon dioxide. The purpose of this experiment is to see if it's possible to single out the green sheep of the family to breed low-carbon flocks of the future. Technicians carefully monitor the animals for signs of distress. They're released if they aren't comfortable with their confinement, but most relax enough to do what comes naturally. It's a bit of an indelicate question, but when you're measuring methane, is that what sheep are farting out or burping out? It's actually what they're burping out, so it's re related to their digestive system. One way to reduce emissions from farm animals is to eat less meat, of course. But for this farmer, it's an opportunity to reduce the carbon hoofprint of his flock. I firmly believe in 10 to 15 years' time, there is going to be a market demand for low methane sheep, or low methane animals, or carbon sequester in farms in general. How much do you think you might be able to reduce methane? I'm, I'm just interested in, in the sort of 10 to 15 percent reduction, because that 10 to 15 percent reduction potentially will give me an advantage in the marketplace when it comes to trying to sell meat to Tesco, Sainsbury's. We've got something different to offer. If low-carbon lamb cutlets don't command a premium, Rob hopes he might be able to sell carbon credits to companies wanting to offset their own emissions, underwritten by his lower methane sheep. Oh. 
After 50 minutes of methane monitoring, the sheep are released to a breath of fresh air and a chance to ruminate on their ordeal. Tom Clark, Sky News, Hertfordshire. Extraordinary images there in the name of science. I never thought I'd see a sheep in what looks like a tumble dryer. Now, in previous months, we've been following the conservationist and explorer Sasha Dench as she tracks the migration of ospreys from Guinea in West Africa back to Scotland. She's recently been in Morocco, where concerns have been raised about a huge new renewable energy project that some experts say could harm migratory birds. So this is the Gelmim region where there are plans to build a UK renewable energy farm and uh, ship the power back to the UK. You can see why it is a prime spot for both solar power and wind energy. It blows windy all through the night, there's a vast area of desert. But for some reason this has been a black spot for electrocution of birds on power line pylons. Probablement ça fait longtemps. Il y en a les serres, il y en a une qui manque là. Donc euh, c'est un signe d'électrocution d'un aigle. Some of the most important areas where we need to be most mindful of this potential collision the collision risk for birds is within these migratory flyaways. And Morocco and southern Spain are is an area where a lot of migratory birds get funneled to. Once birds have migrated across the high atlas, they're on the lookout for patches of green where there might be food. And there are plenty in small patches. If you build power lines near them, you're bound to have an impact. On se trouve dans un lieu, notamment quand il y a une forte pluviométrie. C'est un endroit propice aux proies préférées des rapaces. Enfin, en absence, on peut dire en absence des perchoirs naturels. On se retrouve avec un endroit riche en proies, en même temps dépourvu des falaises, ce qui fait qu'on utilise forcément les pylons existants. Malheureusement, c'est une configuration, c'est une conjoncture de conditions qui font que le risque d'électrocution est élevé. Les principaux main drivers de la bird décline sont des choses comme la use, la disease, la um, hunting, broadly. Mais si nous construisons une expansion massive expansion of wind energy and solar energy and, and, and power lines needed to connect them all up, then there is a risk that we'll end up exacerbating those, those, those declines. The good news is there are ways of planning to try and avoid collisions with the main migration routes and also you can build power lines with birds in mind so the chance of electrocution is very small. The pylons might even be helpful as places to perch in a desert region where there are no trees. The company behind the latest project being built here told Sky News they've conducted surveys that revealed no significant passage of migratory soaring birds and that the final design of their pylons and power lines is still under assessment. And I'll be catching up with Sasha again in coming weeks as she nears the end of her journey. But just a reminder, you can catch up with all the environmental news on the Sky News website or app, or by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. And that's it for now. We'll be back same time next week with a special programme all about carbon capture. Can we stop it getting from polluting industries into the atmosphere? And can we pull it down from the atmosphere and lock it away for good? See you then.